Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, a podcast focused on exploring the fascinating world of near-death experiences, communication with spirit, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. The mission of this project is to share messages of hope and inspiration with others, and to spread the word that death is only an illusion. Thank you for being here with an open heart and mind. I wish you peace, light, and love always. Hello, Magic Israel listeners. I told you I had a great guest coming up for you today, and that is true. Uh, This is my new friend. My new friend is Jim Bruton, and he is a near-death experiencer who has an extraordinary life even outside of the NDE itself. Um, This may not have even been the most amazing thing that ever happened to you, uh, Jim. But first of all, I just want to welcome you and thank you so much for showing up today and being here with me to talk about all things spiritual, near-death experience, etc. Thank you, Shannon. So nice to be here with you and your listeners and uh, we'll look forward to our time together. Me too. So where I'd like to start is, Jim, tell us about you. Who, who is Jim? Where did you come from? What were your prior spiritual beliefs growing up? Anything you'd like to share, take it from any year you'd like. Sure. You know, if I were going to characterize uh, my childhood going into my adulthood, literally, it's uh, my life is one of realizing my childhood dreams. When I was little, I would watch um, like wildlife programs on television. And I remember literally saying, how do I do that for a living? And one day I was living in Africa off and on for 14 years, making wildlife films. I have an Emmy for work with National Geographic and I had my own safari business. And uh, another childhood dream was, as a lot of little kids, I love science fiction, you know, especially the utopian version. And, and, you know, being growing up in the sixties, I um, would look at popular mechanics, you know, because they would talk about when we're all going to get the flying saucer in our garage or use rocket packs to fly to work or school. And I was, I kept looking every month, ready to see like the coupon where I could order one. Uh, But again, I love science fiction. And I remember thinking, well, I would, I would like to be an inventor. You know, I would like to invent things and, and invent cool science fiction things, right? Well, while I was filming a sunset in Africa, um, a a Disney film crew came out scouting a location and they had a satellite telephone, which was great because we were 300 miles from anyone. And at this time, a satellite telephone wasn't something small you could carry. It was like several cases and they unfolded this um, nickelized polyester metallized fabric satellite dish. And then they pulled out a handset and instantly they were talking to their LA studios. And I, of course, sat there thinking, what is this? And they said, this is a satellite phone. Well, anybody who's in media is always thinking of a new way to tell the story. So I asked them, has anyone ever pushed video over that? Because I was thinking how cool it'd be to go live from a waterhole or a native village or a jungle or something like that, where you can't just haul in satellite equipment and go live with video. And at this time, it was in 1993, the World Wide Web was only introduced in 93 to give a kind of an organized face to the internet. And the crew said, we don't know. And I said, I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And I was, I I was the first person to figure out how to do it. And because, you know, I double majored, one was physics, one was psychology and, I don't know that that helped me, but it helped me uh, articulate my questions. So anyway, um, I was able to do that. And I used this sort of taking a TV truck and shrinking it to a backpack concept to go and uh, shoot live video where it was never possible before. I field produced a Titanic expedition for the Discovery Channel. I retraced the Magi for uh, Microsoft when they had a sort of travel adventure site. I um, went to Antarctica several times, circumnavigated Antarctica, um, and I even modified it for use in telemedicine, uh, and I became a lecturer at Yale University School of Medicine, integrating biometrics destined for the International Space Station. So there it is, full circle, right? 
And eventually I uh, became a war correspondent for NBC News using this system because, again, the, the ability to go live with video where they couldn't before was obviously going to be of interest to the major news organizations. And then um, another thing was I, I fell in love with old airplanes. My dad learned to fly when I was in the first grade, so I, I probably had 10,000 hours of passenger time by the time I was in high school. And somewhere in here, I too fell in love with aviation. But like I said, nothing's been normal up to now. So why should this be normal? I was interested in the really old airplanes, like, you know, around the time of the Wright brothers and maybe up through World War I. And, you know, I would take clothespins and playing cards and put them on my bike so the spokes would hit them and make like the sound and imagine I was flying around in these old airplanes. And then one day um, I started, I, be, I did become a pilot for fun. And then I built a, a very faithful reproduction of a World War I fighter aircraft, uh, like the Red Baron flew, but it wasn't red, it was my own paint scheme. And then I built a, another little whimsical airplane that looks like it came out of a Disney cartoon. And that one figures into our story later on. And truly the, I would say the fourth dream I had, or you know, as a kid was, I wanted to know about God. Don't know where that came from, but I thought about it a lot. My grandmother was a, a unity minister, and every year when she'd visit, I would keep her up till 2 a.m. asking her question after question. And uh, it was just a burning desire to know God. So, the, you know, I have had a near-death experience, and um, that kind of fast forwards to some of it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, that second aircraft I built, it's called a Flying Flea. It was patterned after a 1933 aircraft, very small. And, you know, with a big motorcycle engine right in front of my face, spinning a big prop. And it was on my second test flight that I lost my engine. I couldn't make it back to my airfield. And where I live in Connecticut, it was just a lot of hills, a lot of rocks, and a lot of forests. Luckily, there was a Boy Scout camp nearby that had a small lake. So I thought, well, the, the front of the aircraft was almost shaped like a boat. So I said, I'll just, you know, aim for the lake. I'll come in, landed in the water, it's open cockpit, I'll pop the belt and I'm out, no problem. The only problem is when I came in, when I, you know, came in with no power, and again, this is my second time flying the aircraft, so I wasn't quite used to the glide ratio yet. I overshot the bank and hit all of these trees headlong at about 70 miles an hour in the equivalent of a soapbox derby car, okay? When I stopped crashing. There was literally no plane left around me. It was all matchsticks. And um, luckily, there was a man fishing there because he liked fishing there when the park was closed because it was nice and peaceful unless you have a plane crashing. <laughs> and he ran over. And uh, luckily, he had a cell phone on him that day. And he um, called 911 and kept me propped up because he could see I was having problems breathing. And uh, the reason. I was having a problem breathing as I had ruptured both my lungs. I broke all my ribs, my right leg, multiple fractures, and I had a hole in my lower back. And other than that, I was fine. But he had to, uh, you know, call 911, got the helicopter to come in. And also to my advantage, he was a retired policeman. So if you think about it, a lot of people seeing all this could have just freaked out. And in freaking out, that would have gotten me killed but he was a retired police officer. So he'd seen trauma like car wrecks and things like this. So he could keep his, he could keep his calm while um, keeping me alive. And the helicopter came and they flew me up to Harford's uh, trauma center. And I can't say enough good about them, them up there. I mean, they were just like a incredible efficiency. They were waiting for me. They took me right in. Now I'm saying this all in retrospect because I actually have no memory of my crash. And later on, when I was looking through my emails, I realized I didn't remember. The, the last email I remembered reading was two days before my crash. I knocked out of me, out of my system, two days worth of memories. So uh, by the time uh, anybody realized where I was, because this like news flash came out on um, you know phones that said, there's been a crash in this area, they, they realized it was me. By the time they got to Hartford, I was in a breathing machine. I had all kinds of tubes going in and coming out of me. I was intubated. Um, 
And I had already escaped my restraints once and they had to re-restrain me. So when my family got there, they said, you know, he's, he's a bit of a handful. And I, we can tell you he has at least a week's worth of full day operations coming up. And we could lose him at any time. In fact, some of these operations only have a 2% chance of success. They said, we recommend we put him into a coma for that time. And everyone readily agreed, that's good. You know, he'll get more rest and he won't be, you know, like trying to escape and <laughs> like, like I could. Uh, so uh, in my best record, I mean, in my best logic that I can put together is when they put me into a coma here, that's when my near death experience began. That is so interesting. And, and I actually uh, am extra interested just because my uh, former boyfriend of eight years was a, he's a pilot. And so, um, and it started as a passion and now that's what he just, that's not his day job. That's just what he does. And so he has a whole YouTube channel. And um, so uh -huh. uh, I got to go up with him in a tiny little Cessna kind of thing. So, yeah. um, but I also know the dangers of it. And, um, and I know also that it's not as dangerous as we think necessarily, but um, I, I think that's so fascinating too, that you have what the body does to protect itself from trauma too. Um, the fact that you have no recollection, do you, you don't remember being in pain at all or anything of that nature, no. which is again, the body's way of protecting itself, which is so interesting. And I'm um, grateful. <laughs> yeah. I am so happy to hear that because I can imagine that would be uh, pretty terrorizing. Um, so, all right. Um, you're in a coma. What's, what are you experiencing? Right. Well, you know how NDEs, like if you read NDE stories or you hear NDE stories, as you know, there are, there are a lot of common hallmarks to them, you know, going through a tunnel and the tunnels are described in many, many ways. Uh, seeing deceased loved ones on the other side, maybe seeing beautiful vistas, uh, angelic beings at some point having a life review, then they may or may not, you know, get a big message and then they're sent back. If, you know, <laughs> I say if they choose to come back, we only hear those stories. Um, my NDE was very, very different. There was no tunnel, no dead loved ones. There was something that happened that could be a, a translation of a life review. And then I guess, you know, I, I did get a, a message on my way out. I wouldn't say it was anything earth shattering, like, you know, here's the cure to cancer or something, but it was still important. And I guess if that's all I brought back, it's enough. Um, my NDE was where I, I guess, like you could say, like teleported, boom, I just was instantly in this place. And I remember it was like I was up on a terrace of a very tall building, like a skyscraper. Uh, and I like appeared there, I was on my right knee, right knees on the ground, my left foot was flat on the ground. And I just was just appeared there like this. And then as I looked up and then stood up, I could see the skyline of a post-apocalyptic city. I've characterized it by saying, imagine New York City looking at its skyline a thousand years after the meteor hits or a thousand years after the nuclear bath, uh, blast. You know, it's kind of like the Planet of the Apes thing, right? And I, I didn't have any emotion about any of this. I'm just taking it in, accepting what I'm seeing. And above me were these dark and heavy clouds, you know, they like the mother of all storms getting ready to cut loose. And as I'm taking all this in, all of a sudden this wave of nausea went through my stomach. And I remember like, wow. And I, and I, and I it's like, a, again, you know, you're out of the body, but I would characterize it as saying out loud, I don't know that I can stand this. And when I said that, I heard the sound off to my left and I looked over and I saw this tall, like a four story high representation of an egg. But the egg was made out of open lattice work. It wasn't like a solid shell. You, know, you could see through it. And within it, I could see tiny movements. And I realized that's where the sound came from. So 
being that you might say it was the only interesting thing around to look at, I, I went over there to, to check it out. And as I looked through that open lattice work at the source of the sound I'd heard, I saw all these gears just sort of freely suspended in air. These were a special kind of gear I had that I, I didn't know I'd ever seen them before. I couldn't say where I would have seen them. They're called a sector gear. The reason is when we think of a gear, you think of a little like wheel with little teeth all the way around it, right? And a sector gear would be a, a partial section, sector, section of that gear, like a pie, pie slice, if you will. And it's designed to be in a machine where it moves back and forth like this, right? There's a beginning, a middle, and an end to its motion, then it comes back. You see these in clocks. Yeah, that's where you might see them. Um, so, or clock-like mechanisms. So I, I realized it was like hearing them move that that's the sound I'd heard. And the interesting thing is some were like very clear and distinct, like I can see you clearly, right? And some were almost ghost-like, like they were a little out of focus. But as these just sort of were in, in like idling in their motion, like they, they weren't moving with purpose. They were just sitting there kind of idling like fish swimming in a tank or something. Some would just pass right through others, like physically impossible, but they just would. And I remember thinking probably around, you know, the ones that were very deaf. And I said, I wonder if I can touch these. So I put my hand through the lattice, big open lattice, and I to try and touch it. And as I did, another gear appeared and it just brushed by my hand. And when it did, I had another wave of nausea hit me. And instinctively, reflexively, I was able to grab it and I took it out through the lattice and I just kind of like threw it away. And when I did, all the gears inside started spinning around. And at this point, I said something like, like, what's what's going on, you know? And this voice, not a there was nothing I could see, but this voice came and it stayed with me throughout my entire experience. And we had a conversation and it said, um, this is the future birthing into the now. This, this is basically, this is what becoming is. And I said, well, how did I know I could do that? You know, like remove that gear when it hurt me and goes, why else are you here? I said, I don't know. I don't even know where I am. And it said, you're in the in-between. I said, in-between what? And it said, everything. Uh, you're standing inside the eternity of a single moment. And I said, I really don't understand that. And it said, well, do you remember the world to which your body belongs? And I said, no. And I didn't. I would say I was depersonalized down to zero. I, like I said, I had no emotions about what was going on. I had no fear. I wasn't really thinking about what was going on. Uh, I was just aware of what I didn't understand and I was able to articulate it. And when I said I, it is another way I've characterized it. If somebody had come up and say, if you stay here longer, you can't go back. I would have said, go back where? To your family, what family? What's like, what's a family? And when I said I didn't remember who I was, it said, then you see the truth and how the past is dust. And we just sort of carried on the, the conversation. And, and I, I, I came to realize that I was being given the opportunity to reach inside this egg and remove, remove choices in my future. Because I, I realized these are things, these are, because every time I looked at a gear, it's like the video feed of what it represented played in my head, All right? And I can see this is when I'm older. These things haven't happened yet. Or maybe I might sort of like see myself when I'm older. And I was being given the chance to remove future choices that would be to my spiritual detriment. And did I do this with a moral compass or a mantra or the idea of a group? No, I did it with pain. The pain, if I touched a gear and it caused that wave of nausea, it was as if I were feeling the pain of making that choice now. And this is why I say it's like an analog to 
the Life Review, in which people have said they feel the emotions of the people they've hurt. And, you know, it's kind of, kind of reminds you of Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. You know, he goes back and sees, you know, how nasty he was to people. And he comes back and says, I want to be different. I want to, I want to try to rectify this. And in my case, rather than seeing my past, I was seeing the fruit of, in the future from the choices I'd made in the past. And to me, that was presenting me with what I call actionable intelligence. Like it wasn't going to do any good to make me feel bad, especially if I had no ties to the past, right? <laughs> but if I can feel the pain of a bad choice I could make in the future, then that's an easy way to avoid making that choice. And so it's kind of like stacking the deck. So I was just over and over, I would kind of like reach around and search around till I found something that caused me pain. I would remove it. It all recycle and begin the process again. And that's when this conversation was going on. And I remember um, at one point, and, and by the way, the conversation is detailed on my website, if I may. And that's in between productions with an S dot com. In between productions dot com. It's also uh, recounted in the two books I've written that are on Amazon. One is uh, The In-Between, A Trip of a Lifetime. And the second one is The Practice In-Between, The Art of Letting Go. And, and the conversation is detailed there. Uh, but one time when, when I was removing you know, a bunch of gears, I turned around and saw this huge pile of gears behind me. And I said, wow, am I, am I going to die sooner from doing all this, from removing these future events? And it said, your number of breaths are already counted. I will worry about your last one. And then it said something that may be one of the most profound things anyone's ever said to me. It said, for those who make poor use of their choices, offering fewer possibilities could be called mercy. Yeah. And at some point, to be honest, I do remember it feeling like torture after a while to just keep watching these events in my future go around and around again, like say refitting themselves around an opportunity that was now gone. And I even asked, I said, you know, the, all these things I see in my future, I don't know where, when, or what they are. And it said, that's not important. The answers to what comes tomorrow are a waste it's better to see how things fit and refit together. I was being told basically, don't worry about it. Have faith in the grand design that everything has a place. Everything, th there are no accidents. There's no misplaced event. It's as it should be. And finally, uh, after <laughs> God's honest truth, it was like, I just got so tired after like, well, it had been, been a, the 10,000th time of watching these gears spin around. I said, I think I can live with this now. And at that point, um, it said, I'm sorry, it's just, it's a moment, right? I, I said, it said, be gentle with everyone as I'm gentle with you. And I said, what's gentle about all this? And it said, your being here is an answer to a prayer. He said, Basically, as I was starting to, I guess, fade out, it said, everything is interconnected and pay more attention to your relationships. And now the man who fell from the sky is not the same who flew into it. And that's when I came back. I just want to say before you continue that what really is so affecting in your story and so many others is how the detail is how specifically you can remember these things. If this were a dream, you know, you wake up the next day, you're like, and then he said some weird stuff to me and you can't. It fades. Yeah, it fades. You can't consistently remember it. Excuse me. <clears throat> and um, it's so specific and it's so message driven that even if it were, and I just say this because I know there are uh, these people out there that the scientific minded people that will say, oh, it's a hallucination. Well, 
the thing is that all of these experiences, whether you see the white light, and I, I too believe there are the levels, um, just mm -hmm. from what I've heard, that there are different levels. There is sort of what some people might call where you were limbo. Um, I don't know, you know, it's, there, there's sort of these in between, you're not, you're in a coma, your soul's not with your body, but it's not on the, in a different, in, in maybe like the fifth dimension or farther, um, right. but there is a place where it, uh, or a dimension that it, it resides at that moment or that it stays. And I think it's so interesting that there are these, do you have any concept of what, who that being was or what type of being that, that voice was that was speaking to you? Right. Well, we're going to talk about linear versus nonlinear in a little bit, but it would be easy. I mean, the natural question was, do you think it was God? Yeah. Right. And some people might say, do you think it was a devil <laughs> or whatever? Yeah. Um, and then there's the answer is, was it a more evolved version of myself? Mm. Well, if you, I, I tend to approach life from an Eastern perspective. And the Eastern perspective would probably say, well, you're already one with God. You've always been one with God. And it's just where your attention is focused. You know, we, we've come down here to have a human experience. And it seems like sometimes it's predicated upon a certain amount of forgetfulness. Yeah. And we have to remember our way back. And so I think you know, taking that into account, if we're already one with God, then the answer, it was God and it was me, are the same. Yeah. And I accept that. I mean, sometimes it's easier to understand something if we model it, if we project it out of us as something we can kind of walk around and look at from different angles, see how the sun glints off of it and look at multiple entry paths to it. Um, I mean, that's why sometimes we, we draw pictures as we solve problems, right? It's, it's so that we can get it out of our head and sit there and look at it from these different angles. And other people can too. And sometimes they'll have an impression or they'll say something and that helps us better understand what is coming out of us. So all I can say is whoever it was seemed to know a whole lot more than I did at the time. And it was there was nothing um, demanding of it. There was nothing bossing me around. It literally was just responding to, to me. And it was definitely guiding my understanding of what was going on and the importance of it. In fact, one time I said, um, why don't I have a better moral compass than pain? And it said, the pain you're experiencing now in even considering these choices isn't as much as carrying the crushing weight of those chains once they're forged around you or karma. And there are gold chains and there are iron chains, but they're chains all the same. Yeah. I mean, you're a I really mean, smart guy, but for all of these thoughts, it, it, you know, all of these really deep wisdom bombs, I'm going to call them mm -hmm. as smart as you are, it just, you know, you're in a coma at this point. And so it does feel, it does feel a bit higher self too, that uh, I think we all have this sort of deep knowing and wisdom inside sure. of ourselves, but we don't sure. even know that we have access to it. If but I can it, add to that, because you brought up a really great point, Shannon. Okay. Remember I said that basically I, you know, from, let's say from the time my coma started, I had no memory already two days back, right? When I came out of the coma a week later, I would say I didn't have any memory or really a functioning mind for about a week. Right, I right. didn't even come to, if you will, you know, like consciously, I'm aware, I have a mind, I, I can think, I can remember. Uh, in the hospital itself, it was when they moved me to a rehabilitation hospital that I would say I had my first awareness. So think about it. To have a what we could call a super conscious event bookended by two periods of amnesia. How weird is that? I know. And that's <laughs> what I mean. It's like, if this were a book you were writing, well, you'd have time to think this all through. Well, what should that higher being say? Something like this. But the fact that it all just comes in through telepathy, I believe, um, sure. and, and the sort of osmosis of it all is so fascinating. Um, and to me, very convincing as well, um, just in terms of 
uh, people having such similar stories, even though you said you didn't have the white light, you didn't see the the past loved ones, but at the, all the same, you had these very profound wisdom, uh, nuggets of wisdom and just said so, so flatly and without any thought behind them. And at this point you're unconscious. So for you to be able right. to formulate these Yoda like conversations would really be a stretch. So that's what I, I think is so fascinating about them as well. Right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting too, because, um, I, you know, when a lot of people have near death experiences uh, and they talk about them, a big part of what they talk about is uh, the challenge of integrating this experience into their lives. Like, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, when's the other shoe going to drop? Because all your friends, all your family will be the first to say, you're different. You look the same and sound the same, but you're not the same. And I'll give you an example. Uh, looking at the IAN's website, International Association of Near Death Studies, I don't know if right now it's there, but it actually took me a while to realize I had a near death experience. I knew I had an out of body experience. I knew I'd been somewhere, but I don't think I was that conversant with what a near death experience was. And I, I, I mean, who hasn't heard of a tunnel? Who hasn't heard of meeting dead loved ones and all that? But really putting it all together to say, oh, that's what I had, took me a little while after I came home and was sitting there on the couch recuperating and doing my research. You know, it was when I came home and I was recuperating and doing some research on my laptop, that's when I realized I had what's called a near death experience. And even though, like I said, the hallmarks weren't a straight match, it was what a lot of people got out of the experience that I recognized made it the same. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting statistics that I saw in terms of what to expect, if you will, was it said that with normal people, we had a 53% divorce rate. And with people who've had NDEs, 78%. Well, I, I yeah. <laughs> can sort of also speak to that. I just wanted to sort of say that it really, even I, you always hear that when you have a spiritual awakening or when you become a medium, in my case, you're going to, people are going to drop out, you know, they're going to, it's going to sort of winnow grain from chaff, not in a judgmental way, just you're on sort of a, you're on a different, um, you're having a different experience. That's all I, I'll simplify it to say. And um, I, I just noticed, as I mentioned, you know, that I was in an eight year relationship and um although he was quite supportive of what I was doing and um, mm. sort of, I think agnostic or I'm not really sure, but uh, it definitely sort of led to the demise of our relationship as we sort of went like this. And I didn't even have a near-death experience. So um, it just, I sort of became like, I'm on a sort of a different planet. So, you know, we're, we're kind of in different um, head spaces. That's all, you know, it is. So I can only imagine having this profound awareness and and have it like you said having to integrate back into what we call the 3d it must be very difficult to have relationships with a lot of people um just because you're sort of coming from a totally different perspective so continue right. please well it, it's true and you know how young people especially when they're going through puberty can be incredibly self-absorbed why number one they're going through puberty um you know Young, young men and women are starting to assume they're more mature shapes, you know, and like, you know, boys get really strong. So always wrestling and pulling on each other. And, you know, women are uh, becoming the architects of society, <laughs> which is how I look at it, you know, defining the rules of engagement. And uh, it's a similar type of self-absorption when you're digesting what you bit off and chewed with an NDE, because you're wondering, is what was true yesterday still true today? Because it can be that rapid how some of your old attachments are falling away and they just don't have a pull on you anymore. And let's face it, you know, for the spouse who hasn't had the experience, well, you know, this introduces an ambiguity into the relationship. Show me a relationship that welcomes such an ambiguity because it leaves you wondering where your shared hopes and dreams are. You may not even have the same shared, let's be honest, prejudices. Yeah. Um, and it does leave them wondering where they fit in because they realize 
I don't know this new you. Yep. So what do we do about that? And yeah, I mean, I, I went to marriage counseling for 18 months. Uh, and I'll, I'll, the, the problem there, and we could talk a lot about that, is if you do go find a therapist for any reason, whether, you know, because your marriage is in danger from an NDE or it's to understand your NDE, I mean, I guess, first of all, what's the appropriate type of therapy? That's, I what, I thought, gonna, that's what I was going to say. I was wondering, is it PTSD? But if you got the best PTSD therapist, but they don't uh, basically help validate your NDE, run, don't walk. Yeah, I would say that, especially regarding your marriage, because if they think you're full of crap, you're going to have two sane people in there and one crazy person. Exactly. You're already outnumbered. And it certainly can expose other cracks that were already in the relationship. But at one point, I did just sort of feel because I, I, I still maintain a relationship with the in-between. I do. And at that moment, the in-between really kind of came in. And I said to her, I said, um, of the things you might be complaining about, have I done any of those things? And these are small things. The, the, the therapist even said, none of these are enough that you should have darkened my door. And I said, so let me ask, have I done any of these things since my, I said, plane crash, because she would not say NDE. She did not recognize the validity of it. So she just referred to it as the plane crash. So to keep the conversation moving, that's what I said. And being a good person, she said, no. I said, it's because that person died in the crash. This yeah. is what you have left. There's no going back to anything. There's only going forward. And then I said, and if you really want me to put a sharp point on it, our marriage vow said till death do us part. What happens when one of us dies? No matter that we return. Our covenant is broken. And right. the only reason we stay together now is simply because we choose to. And that truth was not well received. <laughs> I'm sure. And it must have been heartbreaking too to, to hear from your partner as well. But it's the truth. Well, and there you are, and there's no denying it at yeah. this point, you know? And one thing is you you start to realize is that here we see life through the filters we want right? In the morning, before you go to work or whatever, you look in the mirror, you say, you know, there's a most competent person to do this job, or here's, you know, I'm, I'm the best dad in the world, and best mother in the world, and best husband, best wife, whatever. You know, you tell yourself all kinds of things to go out the door and face the world. But that's seeing life, again, through the filters we want. On the other side, we see life through the filters we need. And that's why I think a huge universal, perhaps singular experience can be described in so many ways because we all have different needs at the time. But certainly looking into that mirror of truth, you can't unsee what you've seen. It might be warts and all, but it's also light and all. And I think that especially if, you were to ever subscribe to the multiverse theory in which we're like, we're living all these parallel lifetimes at one time. That just may be what, that just may imply the significance of what children of God means. Right. Which is pretty huge. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about that multiverse theory? Cause I'm really fascinated by that. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, certainly it, it's a, concept that's been bouncing around for a little while. Um, let me approach it from a slightly different angle. Yeah. You know how, when we think of reincarnation, we generally think of that as a linear progression through time, correct? You know, like we yes. were something in the past, we'll be something in the future, and what yeah. we call the past, what we call the future. Okay. Well, I'll be, I'll be honest. What's interesting is, as I was working on coming to grips with my NDE, and like I said, one of my majors was physics. It, you know, I get a news feed like everybody else. And one of my news feeds is science. So every now and then something interesting in quantum physics pops up that sounds like Eastern philosophy. And I probably, in the early stages, gained more of an understanding of my NDE from a perspective of, I'll call it consumer grade quantum physics, than I did my books on Eastern mysticism. 
it was amazing. So, you know, I'm downloading all these books and listening to them as I drive around and chewing on that. And one of the interesting things they talk about is uh, you know, like entangled particles, like how you can have two particles that are entangled. And what happens is when they are, whether they're side by side or light years apart, whatever you do to one instantly happens to the other. Something corresponding, let's put it this way, right. happens to the other. If you make one positive, it goes negative. Or if you bump it, it jumps, you know, something like that. And what they did at CERN over in Switzerland, the huge particle accelerator, they took two entangled, they entangled two particles in the lab. And I can't quite remember how you do that, but they did. But what they did is they like put, I'm going to use the colloquialism here. They put one in a jar and they put the other one in the particle accelerator and they sped it around really fast. It speeds approaching the speed of light. Now, one of the things you learn in physics is the closer you go to the speed of light, time slows down relative to where you just left. Okay, so now what's happening is time is going slower for the moving particle than it is for the one that's sitting there still. Like if I got on a rocket ship and flew at the speed of light, if I came back after four years, you might be 40 years older and I'm only four years older. So that's what we're talking about. So this is a proven fact. So they accelerated this particle. And when they brought it back, they said, we can now see that these entangled particles are out of sync in time. And so here's something they said, and I guess they had the theorem to prove this was true. They said, there could be two entangled particles, one at the beginning of time and one at the end of time. And whatever you do to one, you instantly do to the other, which means there is no time that everything between those two is right now. And so if you take that for a moment and consider it, that there is only the now, then the only way to have all of our multiple existences that we use a linear model of time to explain in terms of reincarnation means we're simultaneously living all these lives out right now in all these multiple universes that have been told by yogis to be like bubbles in the ocean. And that's the multiverse theory real quick right there. I love it. I'm so interested in it. And I also, uh, people have asked a lot of, a lot of people have asked, and I did at one point too, how, if you get reincarnated, if you're reincarnated into a different body, well, then how can a medium still communicate with, you know, your mother, for example, um, if, you know, her, her soul's in, on the other side, well, how can she be reincarnated and still be able to communicate? And uh, Monica, the medium is one of my teachers who explains it like there is a higher uh, a higher self sort of, she calls mm -hmm. it a, a clementine fruit. And <sighs> each slice of the orange or the clementine is yes. a piece of you. So yeah. it's all part of you. So you can be, and also there's no time. So you can be living a life as somebody else, but you're still maintain the personality and the feelings and the memories of the person that you were in this particular life. You just might not be aware in this life of those other lives that are happening. Um, right. It really actually makes, it is an, it, it's a really good explanation, I think, of how we are living all these, these parallel lives. And, and it's like a choose your own adventure in one sense, but it's mm -hmm. also not that even that uh, conscious, we're not making those conscious decisions. It's just sort of all happening at one time, which I find so fascinating. Elaborate in any way that you like. Sure. Well, I tell you what, you're, you're bringing me up to the next thing I'd like to talk about. Um, so like I said, my, my first book, uh, A Trip of a Lifetime, it's sort of your standard formula for writing a book about an NDE, right? Here was my life before the NDE, you know, all my world adventures and the crazy things I did. Here is what led up to my NDE and, and the NDE itself. And then here's what, here's how things were different after. And in, in that book, I, I talk a lot about um, just the things you think about, you know, the relationships, um, what we call love versus attachment, um, our, you know, our place in life and things like that. And 
I, um, like I said, during the podcast or even from that book, people would write and say, how do we put into practice some of the things you've said? And I reflected back when I was laying in the hospital recuperating and the in-between, the, the whole near-death experience was just playing over and over in my mind like a video feed. And with each iteration, it was more clear, more definite, more profound, more oomph behind it. And I'm like, what is this, you know? And I, um, I had a conversation, I guess you could say, with the in-between or God. And the conversation was this. Okay, let me preface it by this. Uh, I work now uh, in, I'm a, I, I have my own business. I provide business consulting services or high, very high level, big project management for, for IT, you know, IT big project manager. And that could be a pretty stressful job. So before my crash, I might come home and, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up drinking, but I'm, I might have a rum and Coke, right? And that to just sort of disengage. And if it felt good, I might have two more. Okay, it was becoming a pattern. Um, and I mean, I could choose not to drink, but it just felt so nice to disengage and relax. Uh, and, you know, at, at the age I am, it's not like I need somebody to sit around and tell me what I should and shouldn't do. I'm an adult, right? It's not like I was driving while I was doing it. Still, as far as my spiritual path, I was already following I've been a vegetarian now 45 years. Um, I, I, it's not part of our path. Let me put it that way. So laying in this hospital recuperating, I'm just going to say it was God. God, it's like he removed from me and suspended in air in front of me the representation of alcohol. And he said, what do you want to do with this? Do you want to take it with you, meaning into your future? Or do you want to leave it behind? He said, if you want to take it with you, I will carry it for you. Meaning I have to be a conscious that God's in the room. Right? Yeah. He said, but if you want to leave it behind, I will remove all attachment. It will be as if you never had a drink. It will have no pull on you. And in a flash, I said, leave it behind. Oh, yeah. And I saw it just kind of fade and disappear from view. I haven't had a drink since. Don't think about it. It's kind of like being a vegetarian. Eating meat is something other people do. Yeah. And so is drinking alcohol. I can go into a wine shop and buy two bottles of wine for a dinner party. It doesn't mean I have to have it, but I'm not tempted to get one for myself. I can sit in a bar with people who are drinking and I don't even think about it. It just doesn't occur to me. And I've actually practiced that exercise. I mean, let's face it. You could say that's a visualization exercise, right? I've practiced it with other things and it's amazing how it works. And I think it has to do with the articulation of some, again, articulating something outside ourselves is creating a model. I think that's key. And I've, and I've asked a couple of other people to please practice this and let me know how they're doing with things. So the, where I'm going is that when people ask, oh, and then what God said was both. He said, all the force of will you'll ever need is found in the art of letting go. He said that always make choices in celebration of the individual spirit. For no one and no thing can stand before the brilliance of a truly naked soul. So that's why I call the second book, The Practice in Between, The Art of Letting Go. And there's, a, there's another, like a Zen statement I heard one time. Maybe I mean, you may have heard of the samurai, the legendary Japanese swordsman, right? The medieval swordsman. And they were like, wow, you know? <laughs> um, there's a statement that says, on the field of battle, when a samurai draws his sword, but he throws away his scabbard, it's because he'll never need it again. On this day, he's free to fight his best. 
it was a similar thing. And I realized this is how we're supposed to live our lives. Every moment of every day, no matter what we're doing, we should always, and I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, I die daily. He said, I, basically, yes, I'm living go daily. And also in the Bible where it says, be still and know that I am God. In my studies, I read the more literal translation is let go and know that I am God. And so that, that's why I wanted to recognize and respect that truth in the title of my book. And I, I can certainly speak to, to that. My, my second book, the, the Practice, the best way to, to talk about it is probably to talk about the five truths, if you will, or picking five truths out that impacted my life. And I would kind of start with, again, you know, laying in the hospital and realizing, wow, what happened? Uh, when I woke up, taped to the wall was a, a picture of myself that, that my wife taped there. And I guess to her, that was the best version of myself. It's me in Northern Afghanistan with uh, the Northern Alliance, which were you know, a bunch of tribesmen that were fighting the Taliban. And it's a picture of me smoking a cigar and you know, there are gun belts everywhere. It's like you know, a perfect match.com picture, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, as I looked at that picture, I realized she put that picture there to say, I want you to heal back to being this person. I looked at the picture and I thought, how many lifetimes ago that already was. Uh, like I said, to anybody who knew me, they would have thought that was the best version of myself. But over the next few days, I began to feel differently you know, about the man in the picture. Instinctively, I was coming to see that my best version was a depersonalized, super conscious being on the other side, stripped of everything. And you know, there I was knowing neither joy or sorrow, I was just flowing in the now beyond time in that state of letting go. Remember, I didn't know who I was, didn't know anything. So lying there in the hospital, you know, like I said, I was having, having this conversation with the in-between, and that's when the, the letting go aspect of, of alcohol came up. So, you know, it sort of begs the question, you know, what, what is the art of letting go? And, you know, in some practical ways I could speak to it, is, you know, while the world chases the next big thing, you know, what if we try a different approach? And if we don't like it, we can always ditch it and go back to scratching in the dirt like everyone else, you know, swapping stories of how we know someone who knows someone else who made it. <laughs> but to me, I realize now that life wasn't ch about chasing the next big thing. It's about letting go. And that if you look the phrase up, you'll find it is an art of doing something so ephemeral as nothing because that's exactly what it is. It's about detachment, of owning your power to make good choices moment by moment that reduce the number of bad potential choices and their, you know, again, nauseating outcomes. And it's really about realizing that power within you. And it's an understanding that has no context. It's simply a state of knowing. It's kind of like saying, you know, while we sit around and answer questions, it's never as satisfying as awakening to the question and talk about that a little bit. Um, but basically, it's about how it gives rise to meaning and meaning backs into our individual lives to give us a sense of what our unique purpose is based on our likes and dislike, our aptitudes, whatever. So that that's an important question in terms of when people ask, what's the purpose of life? Like I say, I kind of back it in from what's the meaning of life, which is sometimes a little more of a universal answer. Um, but anyway, the, um, that detachment really helps with that, for want of a better word, you know, depersonalizing process of removing ourselves from the equation, from the content uh, of the processes that flow around us. We're not the center of any particular universe. And once we understand that, we can see how little of what anyone is doing has much to do with us personally. The tip of an iceberg is what we see, but our appreciation of what it really is is 90% hidden from view. And a dual mind is where something is simplistically only this or that, right? You know, so like we're vaccinated or unvaccinated, we're Republican or we're Democrat, you know, th these kinds of black and white 
truisms. Yeah. So we argue and we struggle to reconcile those polarities all the time, you know, even to the point of trying to legislate them. But meditation and open-mindedness lead to a non-dual state of mind where we think in terms of and instead of or. Imagine that one difference in the world and, and that you can make in the world with that one change in word that instead of saying us or them, we say us and them. And we realize we're really all in this together. For example, in Taoism, you know, they have the yin and yang symbol and it represents the polarities of yin and yang with a complement of each as a seed of the opposite within. Usually you see like a little dot of white on the black and black on the white, because we do. Nothing is all one or all the other. It's in those shades of gray in between those polarities that we truly find each other because no one is all good or no one's all bad. And in those shades of gray in between, that's where we learn by association. And that's also where we find compromise. And that's how we come together. And that's certainly how we live life. Um, so to let go, I would say start by allowing choices to unfold naturally. Wait as long as you can before choosing to allow the other possibilities to fully mature. This allows for the arrival of new information that might impact your decision, you know, just in time communications and things like that. And with your stillness to create your vacuum, for example, gain through meditation or through practicing meditation, then you can release that into its chosen direction. And when you let it go, it's like, you know, shooting a bow and arrow and just letting it go. If you focus on shooting and then when you let go of the arrow, the arrow goes there on its own. And this is what is done when you're still present and you understand how you feel and to know what it is you need. That's what creates that vacuum. And you aim the vacuum with your intention. And like I said, the arrow will go there on its own. And you shoot that arrow because you love shooting at the target. The outcome, winning a prize, is a totally different thing. And it distracts you actually from shooting perfectly. You have to choose between the process of shooting the bow for joy and the content of winning a prize. Just focus on shooting and the outcome will take care of itself. I think the important thing there is to let go of outcomes. We can only be responsible for the effort we put in. You can't always be responsible for the outcome. You don't have to see or know all possible choices you can make in the future. You might not yet know what they are. They might emerge over time. All you need to know is whether they feel neutral or good or bad. And if they feel bad, if they run counter to your values and emotions, dismiss them. And to do that, you have to be honest with yourself. And spiritual studies in quantum physics, like I mentioned, state that every moment is infinite with probabilities. Our conscious decisions continually collapsing one of them into defining our present reality. It's at that still point of meditation where we become present and we realize we're within the center of all possibilities. It's like standing in a river, just letting the current and what it carries go around you without grabbing anything. If you create the right meditation space in which to simply breathe, you'll naturally become more and more contemplative. And it doesn't become something you do, but someone you are. And that's how you pray without ceasing. And when you live a life that is prayerful, you'll never have to pray again. That's beautiful. Yeah, so we, you know, like I said, we, we can also talk about, you know, linear and non-linear thinking. I wanted, that was gonna be my next, <clears throat> that was gonna be my next question um, because you said, you had mentioned that earlier about the linear and non-linear. So uh, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'd love to hear about, about that, about your thoughts on that. Sure. Let me begin by using a couple of examples. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell you how this all came up and it'll be a fun story in itself. But let's, for example, say here's a here's here could be a normal question. Who robbed the bank? Right. Linear thinking pursues answers through a step by step process that have a, a go, no go gate at the conclusion of each step, you know, deciding whether we move on to the next step or we go around again. And um, like I said, iterate this step to with more detail. Thinking this way is pretty much about the black or white of things, go, no go. Um, and binary thinkers though, they, they may miss an opportunity or like I said, reaching a compromise. And some patterns of information 
remain invisible to them because those become their filters. They are inside the box thinkers because part of the process is defining the problem, which means defining the box and then working on it, usually from the inside. But what happens to your problem solving journey if the primary assumptions or procedures break down? This is how most of the world thinks. It's also impossible to think or process information this way when you're present. And I've seen that um, through, I, I don't know if I'd call it out of body experiences or just lessons that come in the middle of the night. So let's say this, the better question may be, why do people rob banks? Nonlinear thinking brings understanding by promoting thinking and problem solving that extends in an outward expansion spiral. Or, you know, that, that provides multiple starting points from which you can study a problem and provides multiple ways through rather than trying to solve the surface symptom of who robbed the bank. Most problems are caused by other problems stacked on top. Linear thinking keeps the mind sliding on the surface going around in a circle versus again that upward spiral. Nonlinear thinking goes deeper, spiraling through different perspectives you know, revealing other aspects of consideration. And it's a much more evolved way of thinking. It's also more natural to think this way when being present. And the style of following the breadcrumbs, you see the whole loaf because you step back and see it and you walk around it. Like I said, you model it. Your awareness of this emerges when you realize you aren't using your memory to understand things anymore. And you don't need memory to perceive a complex and dynamic pattern moving in front of you. I mean, if a caveman can throw a spear at a mammoth and hit it in the eye, how much calculus do you think you could say he's subconsciously doing? <laughs> but he wouldn't know what two plus two would. He wouldn't understand the concept of zero. It's a right. kind of case in point. But when you're really present, it is with no memory of the past or anticipation of the future. You're using your intuition. It's like having faith that you have the native intelligence to figure out pretty much whatever comes up, right? And for example, when we hear someone speak, their words give us answers, but from their nonverbal communication emerge patterns of meaning. And we've all heard about how uh, when someone's speaking, maybe, and again, the ratios differ, but 40% of the information may be in their spoken word, but the other will be their nuance, their inflections, their body language, and even a pause that's pregnant with meaning. And by looking at the patterns, you discover the underlying formula, if you will, that things and events use for their birth, duration, and expiration. For example, DNA. It looks like a thing, but the information inherent in it translates into generations of unfolding. That's the case in point. And you must disengage from the excitement of the moment as well to observe the patterns operating beneath. So, you know, don't get too excited and don't get angry and you'll think much more clearly and see things much more as they are as a result. And I've, I've chewed on this for a long time, you know, and I've gained a lot of new insights into problem solving during my approaches to a question and how intuition needs to be developed and trusted. And that's one of the things I think our education system may hurt us with, you know, don't trust your intuition, you know, here's the science, <laughs> follow yeah. the science. But if you do that, you'll perceive a lot of deeper truths in any situation. And I became aware as a result of how our intuition is not only greater than we can know, I realized how our ability to intuit is greater than our ability to know. And that's, that's a big truth. I think that's why the death of a spouse is the most stressful event the living spouse can experience. But an NDE is the most stressful event a marriage can experience. So because the NDE is integrating their experience into their life through intuition, while the non-experiencing spouse is trying to understand what it means in a more linear fashion, you know, that, that leaves the non-experiencing spouse wondering, well, what does this mean for me? You know, wh what about all our plans and dreams? All the, again, linear <laughs> approaches to life they'd laid out and thought they had an agreement on. And now the experiencer is, is sort of forced into this mon more non-linear world asking every day is what was true yesterday still true today? Because I'm changing by the day in terms of 
what I'm what is resonating with me. Uh, but I'd like to give an example of how nonlinear thought started coming to me. Um, early, let's say last year in early 2021, I, um, I went to bed, but I slept fitfully all night long. And as the depth of sleep is measured in stages, I don't think I got past stage one. Around 3 or 4 a.m., my consciousness was presented with several pages, like pages in a book, suspended in the air in an orderly left to right, top to bottom matrix. I could see that there were words on the pages, but either my eyes or the you know were out of focus or the words were. I understood I was being shown the pages of this book, but I wasn't allowed to read the words because that would be cheating. It was my second book. I hadn't written them yet. So that's why I say it'd be cheating. As I looked at the pages, my perception was switched by an influence outside me from the linear seeing of the words that were out of focus to the nonlinear pattern-based seeing. And in that viewpoint, I gave more promise to the rivers of white that flowed between the words. And then my mind, for some reason, this seemed to be important to the exercise, my mind began flipping back and forth between noticing the words and noticing the space, noticing the words, noticing the space. Now we've shown that information is in the words, but understanding is in the spaces between the words. In the end, the words are me and the spaces are you. This is analogous to when people speak and how their nonverbal communication helps us understand the information in their verbal delivery. And I knew I was being told how to write this book, embedding this perspective into the pages. And of course, I'm thinking, well, how do I do that? You know, do, do I choose words and formatting in such a way that the rivers of white form like Jungian archetypes at the subconscious? <laughs> well, I was like, this, is, this will take forever. But in the end, I realized when I finished writing the book that I had followed the process. And that's that in the book, the which I really don't remember writing the second book, and I wrote it in a month, but I don't remember writing it. But I realized that so many of the things I was writing to, to me had so much punch, I wound up writing them as one line paragraphs so they would stand out on their own. And then I realized that extra space I was giving between them gives the reader an extra you know, split second for an aha moment to go off. And that's when I said, I followed the blueprint. I just didn't know how I would, but there it is. Um, so that, that's how I have approached linear versus nonlinear. And it's kind of funny too, because as I've said, you know, nonlinear lends itself very easily to being present in the moment. It just non-judgmentally seeing what you're seeing as perhaps a nexus of many lines of activity or lines of creation and dissolution. And it's kind of like when we look at a person, right? If we look at a person who might represent something to us, maybe um, they're an artist, a musician, or they represent power, whatever, you know, our, our projections color them in a certain way. But if we stand back, a person is pretty much just a nexus, a, a, a through point of many lines of activity, a line of history, a line of relationships. You know, like they say, some, you know, one person's nobody is someone else's everything. So when we start to see each other as superpositioned possibilities, you know, like, like you, you may be a man or a woman, but you're also, you know, a father, a son, a brother, a mother, an aunt, a daughter. There's so many things to so many people. And then when you put that in the professional context, look at everything you are to other people and how they're dependent on you. Uh, it's, it's looking at the multifaceted nature of what we would call it is, you know, what we would say it is to be human. And you have to take yourself out of the center of everything. You know, it can't be all about you, in other words. And, and I would say that, you know, when, when you see people and, and they're rude to you, it just may be that they were rude to somebody last week and they'll be rude to somebody next week and they're just a rude person or they might just be having a bad day. But 
you didn't wake up that morning thinking how you were going to frustrate them to behave this way. So it really didn't have anything to do with you. If it wouldn't you, be somebody else. They're working something out. And again, the day they resolve it, they're not going to thank you for it. <laughs> right. You're, you're long gone and forgotten. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is on being authentic, how even atheists can be spiritual. Um, so I wrote in my first book after my NDE that I was aware that while God wants to have a relationship with us, we're not forced into one. You know, we can we can ignore God and pretend he or she or it doesn't exist. And our lifespan is so cosmically short that in a moment we'll return in the blink of an eye of an 80 year lifetime and the truth will be self-evident. Right. And if you're right and there is a God, not the one who's going to rub your nose in anything. And if you're wrong and this is all there is, no one will be there to do any rubbing. Right. And I've also felt the truth of you can't row in two boats at once. Like if you were talking to God about your choices, you may well say, hey, I'd like to live a questionable life because I like the sports cars, the money, the attractive sexual partners and all the power. And I think in such a conversation as I've seen here occur in life, God would just say, well, you have free will to do what you want and you can make whatever choices you can. And if that's really what you want to do, then go see how it works out for you. And when you're done, come back. I'm not going anywhere. I think extending this thought, I've come to believe that even if you're an atheist and you live your life authentically, you're living it spiritually, or at least you're laying the foundation to do. And I think, for example, there are many people who believe in God, but they don't always live a life that demonstrates the choices or the sacrifices you might expect if you were making the same declarations. And you don't have to look far to find those examples. And just one I can think of is, you know, what about the people? who do own their shortcomings and who don't justify them or dismiss their bad choices offhandedly, but totally own who they are, warts and all. Isn't there a humility there that makes that person worth learning from? For example, you know, if you were to think of a park bench where somebody on a Saturday night was standing there and got so drunk they fell asleep on the bench, well, now you have Sunday morning. And maybe there's a church next to that part. Maybe the people in the church who have you know, sacrificed doing something else that morning, like sleeping in or whatever, uh, they're at church and they look out the window and they see this drunk waking up. Now you can imagine some of them are gonna have a fairly judgmental attitude toward that person. But what if you went out there and sat down next to them and you said, you know, tell me, tell me your story. And they tell you their story and say, you know, you could probably be making some better choices. You know, your life may be headed in a direction, you know, just physical health, mental health, you know, waking up out here on a bench uh, that could, could lead to unfortunate results. Now, I'm going to say, I bet many of us have known people that if you said that to them, they might not get defensive and they might not try to justify anything. They might literally look at you and say, I know. I know my life's a mess and I need to do, try and do better. And that's what I'm talking about. That is authenticity. Authenticity that was perhaps not found inside that church. And the bottom line thing I'd say there that sums up my opinion is that he who does not have a temple in his heart will never find his heart in any temple. So I think living authentically it goes back to Socrates, man, know thyself. And that's why I've told my kids when they were going through high school, don't ask, you know, where's my perfect boyfriend or girlfriend? Ask yourself how you need to be loved. Don't ask what you should do for a living, but ask what makes me feel happy and engaged. Don't ask what's the purpose in life. Ask what the meaning of life is as you see it, and then back it into the question of what your unique purpose is, given your, again, your unique interests and abilities. The big question is, what resonates with you? Are there consistent patterns of self-sabotage you engage in? Who brings out the best or worse in you? Honest self-reflection reveals the ways in which we can do better, and that is thinking authentically. You in putting the knowledge into practice, maybe first in avoiding situations and people that bring out the worst in you, 
and then trying different approaches to survive such encounters that don't turn you from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. A good test of authenticity is when people talk about saving the world. Some say peace, some say war, some force compliance, a few communicate. Saving the world starts at home, at the kitchen table, on the knee of a parent or at the feet of a grandparent. And then it grows into living a life in the spirit of service to others, no matter your job or career. Doing the things that make you feel connected to other people, perhaps helping those less, less fortunate. You know, sometimes leaving from behind, allowing others to think it was their idea. Sharing the spotlight whenever possible for no one ever arrived where they are alone. Now, I'm not saying to become passive and let people walk over you. Some fights are worth fighting, if not for yourself and for others. And see the world for what it is and see relationships for the temporary comforts or distractions they are. And remember that all of us are just passing through. It's been said that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. So how do you know when you're ready? Many are those who say, show me the way. But there are a few who say, please take me by the hand and leave me because I'm blind. It should be clear to anyone that those who only want to be shown the way are still too proud to be led. And the ego isolates them from the truth. And that's why the world has always been imperfect and always will be. How many people have you seen who need to brag about how much they know about something? They need to be the smartest kid in the room. It even happens when they go before a spiritual person asking for guidance or spiritual apprenticeship. Whether you want to become an apprentice to a master craftsman or a disciple of the Lord himself, save everyone the time by not telling them how much you think you already know how deserved, how entitled you are for that opportunity. In the grand scheme of things, you know what you know, but you don't know what they know. So acknowledge that what you think you know would be embarrassingly small in comparison and save yourself that humiliation. And just instead of complaining about what you don't have, just ask for what you want. You know, what is it we think we know? We yearn to know and we are dying to know. It kind of brings me to the, the last big truth, I think, and that's letting go itself. It's interesting. When I went to my first IANS conference back in 2019, I realized that, you know, when two MDEers meet, don't we really need much of an introduction? It's like we recognize something in each other immediately. It's the strangest thing I ever experienced. In a moment, strangers are in deep and personal conversations comparing notes on living our lives here on earth. And if we don't see each other for a long time, we still have a sense of connection that goes beyond distance. Sometimes we can even feel the emotional state of each other from very far away. That continues even now with many people. No effort really is needed to establish that connection or maintain it. Our mutual resonating like tuning forks keep each other going, you know, no matter where we are. So, if you were to ask me, you know, what is the meaning of life? I have no answer because you are life. What else can I add? Just walk it, discover yourself and realize that you are nothing you were told you are. Because when you die, everything you, everything you think you are will be left at the door. You're more, you're everything. And when you've asked all your questions, and when there's nothing left to be gained, we're all roads in, there God begins. Beautiful. I almost don't want to speak because I don't want to ruin the moment. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to explain the truths as you see them, as you know them so eloquently. And I can, I'm so glad that you've written books because all of this is so important. And I just want to stand up and cheer. Uh, and it's really also you know, that we talk about divine timing and hearing what you need to hear when you need to hear it. Everything that you've said is sort of that thing for me where it's, I've been seeing this happening as I, as I not only age in physical years, but just sort of <clears throat> learn more and evolve more. And uh, part of that is, that's why I went to Costa Rica for 10 days to reset because I was so getting mired in the stress of everything of how am I going to 
do this? How am I going to do that? And what, how, where's my next paycheck coming from? Um, and all these things that I just knew that I needed to go back and reset my whole system and just be, just practice being for 10 days. And interestingly, I came back and I'm really drained. I haven't been feeling well. Um, however, I haven't had any anxiety since I've been back. And mm. suddenly all of the things that I was questioning have started to just flow to me without without me needing to search. Um, all of the answers are being, uh, all of the questions that I had are being answered without any effort. And the money I didn't know, where's that coming from suddenly is just sort of flowing in. Everything's more in flow. So it sort of backs up what you said of, obviously, I know this is an oversimplification, but we can't just sit here and just sit like this all day in meditation and not do anything. Yeah. But <laughs> you have to do stuff also. But it seems like the less I do, the more flows. The less I try, the less I search. Well, you know um, what they say in the Tao Te Ching. The, the foolish man rushes around constantly doing and yet leaves much to be done. Whereas the wise man does nothing and le yet leaves nothing undone. And something you're saying, I'd like to comment on. And that's, you know, I, I used a reference of two tuning forks. You know, if you take two tuning forks that are the same frequency, and you bump one, the other one just starts to vibrate. And you know what? I think that explains romantic chemistry. Yeah. You know, you're with somebody who by all rights, you know, if you did all the external checklist, you'd say, no way. Yeah. But they're together and they've been together and they're happy together, right? Even though it doesn't make any sense to anybody else because simply the way they feel that, that resonance. And I think too, that is how we should approach spirituality. For example, if I may, um, a man went before a guru one time and he said, there are a lot of fake gurus out here. <laughs> and the guru said, yeah, there are. He goes, how do I choose which one? How do I know who knows you know, what I need to know? And this guru said, you can't. You don't know if he knows one millimeter more or you know, a kilometer more than you. And the guy said, so what do I do? He said, just spend some time around them and see what are the trends of my mind? Yeah. Do I find my mind thinking about, you know, what we could easily characterize as vices, you know, like, oh, that girl's cute or that boy's cute, you know, whatever, yeah. or, 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 you know, boy, I bet I can make a lot of money as a guru. Yeah. Something like that. Or do you find your mi mind trending towards virtue? and thinking less about the world or worldly desires. And he said, if you find yourself, again, thinking less about the world, you might want to spend more time around that person. Now, how gentle was that? How easy was that? I mean, it's been said that our, our soul is like a beautiful scarf that's knotted up in a thorn bush, whipped by the winds of desire, to further entangle it. And that once we decide we wanna go home, that that precious scarf is lifted out one thorn at a time. And that even though in our impatience, we might say, just take it and jerk it out, but that would rip up this beautiful scarf. So we have to be patient. And eventually, and it may take more than one lifetime, it will come free. Well, thank you. I, I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, thank you for mentioning your books as well. I'm going to have links below um, about where to, where to find, more out, uh, find out more about you, where to get your books. And I just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time and your energy and for sharing what you know. You just said something about when you meet other near-death experiencers, there's that sense of just knowing and belonging. And even though I haven't had a near-death experience, I have found that to be true of my interactions with people who have had near-death experiences, um, how quickly we say, I love you without, mm -hmm. um, I was just telling someone that, that I think I said, you know, my friendships with Renu and, and Brooke and Trisha, um, we just, it was like, we had, we met, we had an interview and then we started talking and maybe two days later, we're like, I love you. And, uh, you know, and, and it's not too soon. 
because we see each other. We really see each other because even though I haven't had the same experience, I respect, understand, and I try to live. I think I, I, I see things in a similar way, um, just from being the empath that I am and, and uh, the medium that I am. And I, I think it's such a beautiful thing. And the reason I love near-death experiencers is that they are obviously they're human, they're flawed, they they're you know, they have their mo their anger, they feel all the things that everybody else does. But underneath it all, they understand who we really are and what really matters. And it's it just sort of boils down to it doesn't mean they're all they all make the best choices or they're perfect right. enlightened beings. It just means at the end of the day, they understand that love and kindness and connection are really what what it's all about and who we really are and that this is all just like the earth school and it really does lend itself to us having a very similar worldview and i think uh, that's so beautiful and so i'm grateful for you being here i'm grateful for you showing up because this community that th just this podcast has built um not just the, there's the near-death experience community and then also there's another community with these other communities within and i'm so grateful to be a part of it and to have you be a part of my little world. So um, thank you so much for, for that. It really means everything. Um, and it's just so, it's such a pleasure to know you. Thank you, Shannon. It was great to spend some time with you and, and with your listeners and I look forward to a, another time one of these days. Yes, absolutely. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Of course. It was just my editing moment. Now I can stop. Record.